Hi everyone. Just before Venerable Yonten starts, I'd just like to thank all of you for joining us today and also to Venerable Yonten for um, allowing Kung San Yeshi to host you in this virtual Zoom classroom. We're so thrilled to see your lovely smiling face again. And I'm sure everyone here will join me in thanking you. And we so look forward to hearing all the wisdom that you can share with us. Thank you so much, Venerable Yonten. Thanks, Helen. It's nice to see you folks in the Blue Mountains and uh, elsewhere as well. Very welcome to see you guys. And, and we'll start with uh, the eight verses themselves to set our motivation. I think this text is, is pretty familiar and pretty beloved by all of us. And so let's just use it to set our motivation. So really thinking about the verses as we go through them. Determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel, I shall hold them most dear at all times. When in the company of others, I shall always consider myself the lowest of all and from the depths of my heart, hold others dear and supreme. Vigilant, the moment a delusion appears in my mind, endangering myself and others, I shall confront and avert it without delay. Whenever I see beings who are wicked in nature and overwhelmed by violent negative actions and suffering, I shall hold such rare ones dear as if I had found a precious treasure. When, out of envy, others mistreat me with abuse, insults, or the like, I shall accept defeat and offer the victory to others. When someone whom I have benefited and in whom I have great hopes gives me terrible harm, I shall regard that person as my holy guru. In short, both directly and indirectly, do I offer every happiness and benefit to all my mothers. I shall secretly take upon myself all their harmful actions and suffering. Undefiled by the stains of the superstitions of the eight worldly concerns, may I, by perceiving all phenomena as illusory, be released from the bondage of attachment. And so with those eight verses, then we just really connect with refuge and bodhicitta inner refuge, outer refuge, working for oneself, working for others. Working for today, working for the great enlightenment. Okay, so you can relax your attention, or rather shift your attention. The way that we'll structure today and next Saturday is a little bit of uh, history, a little bit of classic commentary, and then meditation and discussion. So I think that with all of these mind training verses, we remember that they are aspirational. 
Yeah. With all of these mind training verses, some of them we can do some days. <laughs> and if we try and push ourselves or squeeze ourselves into a level of practice that we're not genuinely at, it'll just kind of bounce back and make us feel terrible about ourselves for not kind of lifting into our highest ideals. So what we want is to plant very firmly our highest ideals and then gradually work up to being them and embodying them and living with them. So there's this real important place of here is where I want to be and here is where I am and where I am is completely fine and workable and I have everything I need to progress with. By holding these ideals as ideals, I don't need to squeeze myself into a mold I'm not ready for, but I kind of look forward to them as how wonderful it will be when I'm actually a bodhisattva. How wonderful it will be when my self-cherishing is less and when my self-grasping is less. And if I kind of fake it until I make it, some days that's a good approach and some days that's ingenuine and spiritual bypassing. And I'm the only one that's gonna know the difference. Right. So some days, you know, you're like, all right, I know how I'd like to think about this, even though I'm thinking about it lower <laughs> or more afflicted. I know how I'd like to think about it. So I'm act as if, acting as if I already do come into harmony with that. But you still have the self-awareness and the self-kindness and the self-humor that says it's not quite there yet, but we're working on it, you know? as opposed to kind of forcing yourself into everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's good, everything's good. And I love all sentient beings. And that one in front of you who drives you crazy, you're like pushing through the affliction and pretending it's not there. Yeah. And then because of that, there's this weird dissonance in your energy and in your presence with others. There's a dissonance, there's a disconnect. And people will feel it, won't they? They'll feel that what you're saying and what you think are not in harmony. Yeah. But there's kind of the elevated version of where you are right now that you can kind of click into even on a bad day. So look at these verses really aspirationally, uh, enthusiastically as this incredible radical way of thinking about the world. And um, I'll start with just some history because I think it's good to remember the context. So I made you a little PowerPoint <laughs> just for fun. And I'm using a few different sources and you can always find them just at the bottom of the quote. So if you're curious about the sources I'm using, the cover is usually there. And also um, the section that I've taken it from will be on the slide. So here we go. This is from In Praise of Great Compassion by His Holiness and Venerable Tipton Children. And there arose in Tibet a spread of teachings called mind training or thought transformation. Um, these whole category of teachings were developed by Kadampa Geshe's disciples of Atisha and Dom Trumpa, beginning around the 12th century. But it has actual textual roots way back with Nagarjuna in the Precious Garland and Shanti Deva's engaging in the Bodhisattva's deeds, as well as in the Aska Garbha Sutra and the Vilamakirti Sutra and the Akshyamati Sutra, excuse my pronunciation. So those are the sources from the Buddha himself, among others. So Geshe Lungri Tampa was drawing on a tradition that already existed, and he went very deeply with it based on his own experience, but he didn't just come up with these verses out of nowhere. They had really beautiful and important context. So when we're looking at Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna said in his precious garland, may their negative fruits ripen on me may my positive fruits ripen on them, meaning the fruits of my positive and negative karma, right? So the negative karma that other sentient beings have created, which will lead to suffering for themselves and harmful habits for themselves, he's saying, I want that. And all of his positive the actions, all his loving kindness and compassion and wisdom, he's wanting all of the merit of that to ripen on others as happiness. 
So just this one line is kind of the heart of where all other mind training texts come from. And it's the essence of Tonglen giving and taking practice. So Nagarjuna was way back, right? 150 to 250 common era. So yes, did he live a hundred years? Who can say, but he was somewhere in that timeline. And um, he was an Indian, Indian Mahayana Buddhist, one of the Nalanda masters who is widely considered one of the most important Buddhist philosophers. So his text, Precious Garland, contains one of the earliest descriptions of Tonglen, but he's also credited with founding the Middle Way Tenant School, so the most subtle view of emptiness. So then we got Shantideva, our old friend Shantideva, and he also talks about this idea of mind training and thought transformation in engaging in the bodhisattva's deeds or guide to a bodhisattva's way of life, depending on who's translating the title. And he came along a few hundred years later in some of his classic verses that will be familiar to some of you. This is from chapter three of Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life. Shanti Davis says, may I be the doctor and the medicine and may I be the nurse for all sick beings in the world until everyone is healed. May a rain of food and drink descend to clear away the pain of thirst and hunger. And during the eon of famine, may I myself change into food and drink. May I become an inexhaustible treasure for those who are poor and destitute. May I turn into all things they could need and may these be placed close beside them. Without any sense of loss, I shall give up my body and enjoyments as well as all my virtues of the three times, past, present, and future, for the sake of benefiting all." So you can see this is versions of a theme. So then we had our classic Lungri Tampa, who we're gonna go into today. And Geshe Lungri Tampa was an interesting character. You know, we have Lama Atisha, of course, who um, helped us understand about the Lam Rim, but then Lungri Tampa came along and he kind of not skipped the Lam Rim, but he kind of went to the heart of the great vehicle from such a firm renunciation and such a firm understanding of emptiness that it's like imbued with those other two topics all the way through the verses. Even though the verses themselves are kind of explicitly Mahayana, Bodhicitta focused verses, his renunciation was so powerful and strong. You can kind of hear the echoes of it, even as he's talking about the mind of enlightenment. So our key figures in this timeline really are Lama Atisha, way back up there, 982. Um, who, you know, wrote The Lamp to the Path to Enlightenment, our first big Lam Rim stages of the path text. And then we jump down to Lungri Tampa himself. But then from Lungri Tampa, we had some other really key figures that continued the trend of these Lojong or mind training teachings. So we had Geshe Chekawa. And Geshe Chekawa wrote the seven point mind training you know, like uh, banish the one to blame for everything and, um, you know, don't expect applause and all of those really pithy mind training slogans. Um, those all came from Geshe Chekawa, who kind of elaborated on the works of Geshe Lungri Tampa. He says, <clears throat> let's see, of course I can't read it. There we go. <laughs> so Geshe Chekawa says, therefore, until I arrived at Lungso Getsong, yet I feel to realize their meaning in my heart. For if these verses had entered my heart, things would have been quite different by then. Nonetheless, whenever the fear of being attacked by bandits and so forth appeared in my mind during my journey, I reflected upon these verses and this helped. Also, I was often in situations where I had to seek shelter with strangers when my mind turned wild and untamed during times when I was confronted with seemingly unbearable situations, such as failing to secure suitable shelter, or when I became the target of others' disparagement, these verses helped me." So this is Geshe Chakawa's praise of Langri Tampa. You know, he was an amazing practitioner in his own right, 
And he was saying that, you know, had he understood Lungri Tampa sooner, his life would have been a lot easier. But even the surface understanding that he's claiming to have had, had this amazing ability to help him sort out difficult situations. And then, of course, he went on to write a beautiful text of a similar type himself. Other kind of key figures that you'll know about, Ngulchu Togme or Ngulchu Togme Zangpo, who was famous for 37 practices of a bodhisattva, came later. And then, of course, Lama Tsongkhapa, who was famous for the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, Lam Rim Chenmo. So here's your just kind of your general timeline. And not all of these figures do we study in depth, but I think these are some familiar names and it's good to remember that it's all variations on a theme. Variations on a theme, what's the theme? The theme is transforming difficulty into the path. The theme is understanding that everything hard in our life is workable and useful, and not in a sugar-coated way, not in a Pollyanna rose-colored glasses way, but in a deep transformative way where we genuinely see the hardships as useful. Traditions, the mind training texts are central. Lojong is a huge piece um, and they center on the development of the two bodhicittas. Conventional bodhicitta, which is the altruistic intention and ultimate bodhicitta, the wisdom realizing emptiness in the mind of someone with bodhicitta. So they especially emphasize cultivating bodhicitta by means of equalizing and exchanging self and others. And most are written in a pithy, straightforward style that aims directly at the self-centered attitude and self-grasping, the two principal enemies of bodhisattvas. So they eviscerate these hindrances and call out their ridiculous logic that leads to misery, replacing it with more realistic perspectives. The advice the mind training texts give us is the opposite of what the self-centered attitude and self-grasping demand. And their recommended actions are the opposite of what our afflictive mind wants to do at that moment. Of course, that is what makes them so effective at quelling afflictions and protecting us from negativity. So it really is turning on its head our everyday train of thought, our everyday knee-jerk impulses, our immediate assumptions and opinions about people. It's not just a gentle adjustment, it's almost a complete turnaround of what we normally do. So the two main problems, right? We've got self-cherishing as one. And just a reminder, most of you know, but self-cherishing, the deeply ingrained thought that cherishes the welfare of your own self and makes you oblivious to others' well-being. This is one of the twin demons that lie within our heart and serve as the source of all misfortune and downfall the other being grasping at selfhood or self-grasping. So the attitude of self-cherishing has an antidote, right? And the antidote to self-cherishing is bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. So the mind of enlightenment is the primary Mahayana motivation to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings, this main mind with the two aspirations. So then self-grasping is instinctively or innately believing in the intrinsic existence of your own self, as well as of the external world. Self here means substantial, truly inherently existent identity. The wisdom that realizes emptiness eliminates this self-grasping. Okay, so these two, self-cherishing and self-grasping, are the primary focus of combat in mind training practice, right? These are the two demons or the two troublemakers or the two obstacles that keep us from having an open heart 
and keep us from seeing reality, right? Self-cherishing blocks our good heart. Self-grasping blocks our understanding of reality. And both are the focus of mind training practice. So verses one through seven of Geshe Langri Tamba's eight verses eliminate self-cherishing through the method side of the path. And verse eight eliminates self-grasping through the wisdom side of the path. Yeah, so here's the pith. Here's the whole deal right here. You got your two problems, you got your two solutions, and you've got one text that covers it all. Thoughts? <laughs> Are there bits, that's, that's review for most of you, but are there bits that you wanted to just tidy up and clarify before we get into the verses themselves? That distinction between self-cherishing and self-grasping, does that feel clear to you? Look, and you know, like in a perfect world, we're working on self-cherishing and self-grasping simultaneously. We're working on method and wisdom simultaneously. But practically speaking, they take turns in terms of emphasis. So like we're working on compassion and patience and all the friendly stuff, trying to remember that it's all empty of inherent existence, right? And then we're working on the fact that all things are empty of inherent existence and remembering that we do that in order to cut the root of samsara, in order to cut through all of the problematic behaviors and appearances, in order to be of benefit to all sentient things. So it's like they take turns being emphasized, remembering the other one in the background, until eventually they come together and become united in our practice all the time. So the basic idea, which is, you know, summed up in one of our favorite mantras, right? Om Mani Padme Hum, is basically that without wisdom, compassion gets silly. <laughs> compassion gets weak, it gets unskillful, it gets codependent, you know, it gets kind of lacking impact and it becomes just symptoms relief but then wisdom without compassion becomes cold and intellectual and harsh and is missing that warmth that is so important in the Mahayana tradition so just always remembering they both come together and in the verses themselves we need a whole lot of talking verses one through seven to get us into deep bodhicitta. And then once we get into deep bodhicitta, we just land on verse eight, which is reminding us of emptiness. Other texts will emphasize emptiness more, right? But, you know, the, uh, the basic premise of bodhicitta, that we're working to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, it's lovely. <laughs> and then you work, have your life, right? You live your life and people do the wrong thing, or they'll take you for granted, or they'll be bullies, or they'll be deceptive, or they'll betray you. And what do you do when people are just doing the wrong thing? You know, this is the question we want to ask ourselves. We also, of course, want to be looking at our own behavior and seeing when we're inconsistent and full of hypocrisy and hurting people's feelings and being inconsiderate and having poor communication and all the things, right? But I think what's very interesting here is to look at, here's a series of examples of when people do the wrong thing and you're being the bigger person with the bigger attitude mainly, right? It's not like you're better, it's that you're stretching your motivation. And it's that conscious stretching of motivation to the highest, the most vast, the most deep, bodhicitta motivation that protects your mind and it protects you from stress. And then because you're not so stressed, you're not gonna say the awful thing, right? And if you don't say the awful thing, then you're probably also not gonna do the awful thing and then have all the regret and justification and excuses at the end of the day and humiliated feelings that make you all defensive and hard to live with. Right. So if you just protect your mind from the beginning, then you don't have all that fallout of trying to fix all your mistakes. If you do make the mistakes, you can use them then as fuel to prevent further mistakes. Yeah. 
And when you make the mistakes, you're remembering emptiness and not over identifying with them. But this is the thing is that again and again, people will let us down, <laughs> right? People will let us down. People are not a valid source of refuge, are they? Again and again, we turn to them as if they are, right? Communities are not a valid source of refuge. Families are not a valid source of refuge. Individuals are not a valid source of refuge because they have afflictions, <laughs> right? So if you just go in with the assumption that no one is reliable, then when they are, it's this wonderful surprise. <laughs> How wonderful I've found someone reliable. It'll change, but for now, hooray, <laughs> right? We have a totally opposite view of life. We assume people should live up to these standards. Yeah, and we assume everyone shares the same standards that we do. And yet our whole life has proved that that is not the case, <laughs> right? So it's really interesting because it's almost like we expect people to be at their best all the time. Like we think of that time when they were very competent and very kind and very accommodating. And we take that snap snapshot and say, this is you and how you should be and can be. Why aren't you that right now? As if that's their baseline or their default. When in fact, people's baseline and default is something far more neutral, isn't it? And even worse, often. And we're disappointed, like, you said, you promised you'd be this version that I like. And we're not at our best. When are we at our best? Like in one week, how many hours are you at your best in one week? You know, you've got like excellent sort of, I don't know, one o'clock to five o'clock. I don't know. When's your peak time? You got, you know, you got your couple of hours where your blood sugar is at its best. You're at your most alert. You're kind of, you know, recovered enough from the day before, but today hasn't gotten on top of you yet. So what, you've got probably like two or three hours of you at your best each day. And the whole other 24 hours is a mixed bag of a generally polite, somewhat mixed bag, right? We're generally polite, we're functional, we get the job done, but we're not like at our most open-hearted, expansive, patient the whole day. But we identify with ourselves in our best version as well. And we either have a pride and an arrogance that identifies there and says to everyone else, at least energetically, this is me and you better believe it or knows that we aren't and feels ashamed and humiliated and feels that we should live up to it and then gets full of self-hatred and depression, right? So because we identify with ourselves at our best, we exaggerate one of two directions. If we saw ourselves as we were, there wouldn't be such a drama. There would be no one to defend, right? And, you know, who you are right now is fine, right? Like you at neutral or you at like not too bad is a perfectly fine person, right? So why is it you need to keep holding on to this idea of you at your best and then assume everyone else should be at their best when that has really never been the case? This little blips on the radar of them at their best. And we're mad at them for not being your favorite version. Right. So these verses kind of help us unpack that a little bit. And they also help us unpack the idea that people are only useful when they're doing the right thing. Right. People are not only useful when they're doing the right thing. In fact, they're more useful when they're doing the wrong thing. But it's only if your framework of useful is the spiritual path. If your framework of useful is today being well organized. Uh, right? Or your framework of useful is doing this short-term project. Uh. But if your framework is the big framework, then you know that problematic behavior is in a way the best case scenario. But again, it's aspirational. And so we should feel this kind of tug of war of how do I have healthy boundaries? How do I have good structures in place? How do I not be taken for granted and hold up people to a standard that's socially acceptable, not unreasonable, and is kind when they slip? 
while at the same time letting go of all of that. You know, this is the kind of dance that we're doing internally of, okay, it's important to be assertive, but not really, <laughs> right? It's important to be assertive in a certain context and then let it go, you know? And we, we're looking for these patterns all the time in our life where we can say, this is always true and this is how people should be. And we lose flexibility and we lose the spontaneity and creativity of the present moment that says sometimes assertiveness looks like a strong silence. And sometimes assertiveness looks like a direct statement. And sometimes it looks like humor. And sometimes it might even look like anger. But if it's well motivated, it's wrath instead. But that's, you know, expert level, you know. So we just kind of look at these verses and start kind of playing with the way in which they undermine our false logic. And before we do that, just kind of touching base with his holiness, where he says in his commentary on the eight verses, which is in the classic kindness, clarity, and insight, which um, is an old favorite that I think we all love. He says, no matter who I meet and where I go, I always give advice to be altruistic, to have a good heart. From the time when I began to think until now, I have been cultivating this attitude of altruism. This is the essence of religion. This is the essence of the Buddhist teachings. We should take this good heart, this altruism, as the very basis and internal structure of our practice and should direct whatever virtuous activities we do towards its increase higher and higher. We should suffuse our minds with it thoroughly and should also use words, writings as a means of reminding ourselves of the practice. Such words are the eight stanzas for training the mind written by the Kadampa Geshe Longri Tampa. They are powerful even when practiced only at the level of enthusiastic interest. So these are useful for getting us into that deeper worldview, even before their realization, even before they've deeply integrated, even when they're just at the level of enthusiastic interest. And I think that's powerful to sit with and know. So the first one, I've got two different um, versions here. I've got Lama Zopa Rinpoche's translation, and then I've got Tupton Jimpa's translation, and he was one of His Holiness's main translators for many years. And I think, you know, they're saying the same thing, but there's a slightly different nuance. So it's interesting to look at them. So Rinpoche's translation says, determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel, I shall hold them most dear at all times. Then Tupton Jimpa's is with the wish to achieve the highest aim, which surpasses even a wish fulfilling gem. I will train myself to at all times, cherish every sentient being as supreme. So there's a slight nuance here. And I think that both angles are useful and you kind of sit with what's gonna be the most effective for your practice. Thinking about how the benefit from all sentient beings is taken by seeing them as a wish fulfilling jewel. Or just to say, training myself to cherish every sentient being as supreme will surpass even a wish fulfilling gem. Yeah, it's just a slight nuance. And it kind of depends if you're in a slightly more selfish mood than others. So, you know, the verses go in order, it's not an accidental order. They start at kind of like introductory bodhicitta practice, even though they start with hardcore bodhicitta, it's still a little bit lighter than as we go down. So that idea of like wise selfishness, where you realize it's in your own best interest to treat people well, is sometimes where we have to start. And then hopefully we can upgrade. But just like, let yourself be a little bit wisely selfish for a minute and think about <laughs> the truth of it. You know, plain old politeness, plain old patience, giving people the benefit of the doubt, 
taken things with a grain of salt, all the things your grandma told you do help there be a more harmonious society and means people like you. <laughs> right? It's like just so basic. It almost embarrasses us to name something so basic and superficial as if you're nice, people will be nice to you. <laughs> Like you would say to your kids, you know, people are nice to you if you're nice. And yet sometimes we expect people to be polite, kind, and patient to us when we're actually a bully to them. When we're abrupt and we're impatient and we're brusque and we think we're kind of entitled to it because we're in some position, whatever that means. And then we wonder why people aren't polite back. <laughs> you know, it's like... Right, we got to do the math. Like, if I keep having the same dynamic happen in every single workplace or family gathering or friendship group, I've got to ask myself if there's something wrong with my behavior, you know? So, that step back every once in a while, where as Dharma practitioners, we can sometimes jump to it's just my karma, forgetting that there's a present moment condition which is watering that. You know, if, if people keep being disrespectful to us or pe keep being unkind or shutting us out or excluding us or betraying us, some of that is old, old karma. We might have done lifetimes ago and we were really rotten, you know, and now we've kind of grown up and evolved and we've got a good practice, but we're still playing out a lot of those old seeds. And we also might be a bit of a jerk and not even realize it. And it's so embarrassing. You know, because in a certain context, probably we all are. Whenever that like entitlement mentality gets triggered or the how dare you, yeah. It, it's especially relevant whenever you feel disrespected. Yeah, when we feel disrespected, we almost feel allowed or entitled to kind of smack someone down or put them in their place because how dare they don't they know who i am no <laughs> or they do and they don't care right because afflictions right and it's so hard especially i think as we get older but i mean really at any point that you feel personally that you've achieved something as soon as you identify with that then immediately there's like something for people to smack up against. And you think, how dare you treat me this way? How don't you know who I am? Whereas when you're kind of in like new job mode or like trainee mode or new community mode, if people explain things to you or are slightly condescending or slightly patronizing or a little bit disrespectful you kind of wear it better because you're like i'm new i'm new you know how you are when you have that feeling oh, look i'm new it's fine yeah it's okay you got to explain this to me you don't know what i know you know but then kind of you know as we become an expert or we become a long-term whatever it is we start to get more and more aggravated with people condescending to us or patronizing us, or explaining things that we don't think should be explained to us, or speaking to us as a beginner rather than an expert. Like, like everyone has your CV in front of them, like, oh, wait, I don't need to tell you that because I see in 1984, you studied that for good solid six months. Never mind, I won't explain that. <laughs> you know, like no one's got your CV in front of them. They don't know what you know, you know, and even if they do, theirs is going to trump yours because everyone is self-centered right <laughs> so again it's like really interesting to look at why is it you don't hold people up to this really high level of respect all the time when holding them up in this high level of respect usually means that they then respect you right if you want respect respect people <laughs> right Usually when we want respect, we kind of like puff ourselves up into something like big, tall, looking down sort of energy, you know, which is, of course, just going to make people rise up or drift away, right? Trying to prove why you're worthy of respect very rarely gets respect besides lip service, 
Right. So, you know, it's tra tra treating all sentient beings as more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel. You know, you think about, all right, Tibetan um, literature, folk stories, you know, also in the Indian tradition would talk about this kind of mythical wish fulfilling jewel that whatever you wanted, it would bestow upon you wealth and riches and all these things. Sentient beings are more precious than that because independence on them, you achieve enlightenment. You know, independence upon sentient beings, you practice. And it's that very practice that creates the mental momentum to overcome your negative states of mind and to develop positive states of mind. You know, without them, we don't have the same impetus to practice. If you're surrounded by yes men, right? Or people that placate you, people that are sweet to you, it's harder to see yourself clearly where your blockages are, you know, where your stuck spots are, where your love is actually quite conditional. You know, it, it's so useful to have people in our lives who don't like us <laughs> or who we don't like and to, to really feel the rub of that and ask why, you know? And so in this way, they're incredibly precious because without them, what's the rub? What's the nudge? What's the little like thorn in our side or the rock in our shoe or whatever to make us look at what's the deal? So do you have thoughts about that? that whole kind of mind training premise in verse one before we take a little stretch break. Yeah, Heather. Yeah, so much of what you are saying resonates and I, and I think maybe it's around, without going into any sort of details, being in a situation just yesterday with the, my brother-in-law where, um, what's happening is is genuinely um disrespectful you know bordering on abusive and so and mischaracterizing something that i did that was genuinely generous as not and so i'm aware in my mind that if i were a bodhisattva i would be grateful i would be you know and that if I were up further along my path, I wouldn't want credit for being generous and all of these things. And I, and I make myself nuts when I just can't just let myself sit with, he's just a jerk. And so I, you know, I don't really know how to work with that. When you're talking about puffing yourself up, all of that makes a lot of sense. But in those instances where I feel like I have to sort of be on my own side, even if there's no me, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I wonder if you have the thoughts about that. Yeah, yeah. It's the classic tale, isn't it? You know, there are many conflicts in our life where we can see both sides and we can see where we were being a bit uptight or we weren't being forgiving or whatever we were being. And they also were doing stuff and we can see both sides and be reasonable. But sometimes the other person really did the wrong thing. <laughs> They just did. It was the wrong thing by anybody's standards, by any cultural standards. It was the wrong thing. And then here you are trying to be a good bodhisattva, just grumbling, right? Like, what the heck? Like, how dare they, you know? And the key here is to think observation of kind of like objective worldly truths is not a problem, right? Mind training isn't about pretending a bad thing was good. It's about saying the bad thing is useful and that is good. So you're not like jumping over all the steps, right? You're not saying the bad thing is good. You're saying the bad thing is useful and that is good. You feel the distinction, right? And so the bad thing, you know, is empty of inherent existence, you know, is karma ripening, you know, the big picture, but what you're doing with the big picture is not gaslighting yourself. What you're doing with the big picture is allowing that to make you calm. Because once you're calm, you're not speaking from afflictions as coarsely, right? Like remember in, in Minds and Mental Factors, the definition of an affliction is that which makes the mind unpeaceful, right? So if the mind is agitated, an affliction is on its way to the surface or already is. So if you can get the big worldview, whether it's a method side or a wisdom side or both to get you calm, then you address the thing in front of you you know, head on courageously, but you've got all of the tools of your whole life right there. 
when your mind is agitated, you might almost by accident wind up doing the right thing or the useful thing or the thing that will fix it. But it's like your choices are just kind of immediate. Whereas when you're calm, you've got all of the choices of your life. You know, you can choose the tool for this situation rather than have the tool kind of choose you because that's just kind of what occurred to you in the moment. And then if it's not effective, you're also not taking it as personally or not as worried by it. You don't have such a kind of short-sightedness about it. So yeah, that is, it's the key is to not let the idea of these verses make you gaslight yourself, you know, or speak over the top of your own common sense. But it's an internal recipe to self-soothe and to broaden the, the view and then to act from that place or not act, but now you've got wisdom on your side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Easier said than done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, other, other thoughts about the whole premise of mind training or about that first verse, seeing sentient beings as precious? Hear you. I find all these thoughts to be uh, an antidote to um, uh, negative thoughts like anger and self-cherishing, all of that. Just think of these verses, especially that first one, to, to exchange, to think of others. Great yeah. antidote. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they kick in, you know, when they're repeated again and again, don't they? They kind of jump into your mind more and more frequently when there's trouble. Yeah. Yeah, other, other thoughts? Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a question. Yeah. Francoise. Hi. Um, I've got a question regarding self-cherishing. Uh, in my mind, if I don't self-cherish, I can't actually um, be nice to other people. Like, I, like for me, I'm may, I may be misunderstanding the, uh, the meaning of what self-cherishing is. Um, for me, it's looking after myself, making sure I'm okay. So if, I'm, if I don't look after myself and I'm not physically and mentally in a good place, I'm not really sure I can actually take, um, be nice to others or do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And that's, um, it's a solid point. And remember that self-cherishing kind of in colloquial English is different than self-cherishing in Buddhism, right? So just colloquially, you know, self-care, self-compassion, self-cherishing, colloquially, those are important things to do, right? If we don't look after ourselves, who is, you know, if we don't feed ourselves, no one is going to feed us magically, you know, unless we have our mother close by and maybe not even them, right? So self-cherishing in Buddhism means looking at yourself so self-centeredly, so short-sighted that you're oblivious or indifferent to other people. You don't even notice the impact you're having on other people. You'll work for your welfare, even at their expense. Yeah, so you'll hurt people and maybe not even notice because you're so self-centered, right? So that's what we mean by self-cherishing is maybe what we would normally say in English, selfish, but it's kind of more than selfish because it's not always aggressively mean or aggressively greedy. Sometimes it's just noticing your impact on other people, right? And um, some of you in the Blue Mountains will know I love this example, but the example I always like to think of is children with backpacks, right? <laughs> Especially children with backpacks on public transportation is my example of self-cherishing, right? So they're just having fun, talking to their friends, trying to get their seat, moving somewhat abruptly as children do, and they knock over things with their backpack or they smack into people with their backpack. They might even really hurt someone, but they don't mean to, right? They're not being bad. They're just in their own world, right? 
And, and to me, that's kind of our everyday version of self-cherishing. It doesn't always escalate into obvious anger or obvious attachment. Often it's just kind of indifference or obliviousness where we don't see that we're knocking over things behind us just by being so self-centered. Yeah. So that kind of self-cherishing is a huge obstacle to bodhicitta and bodhicitta is the antidote to it. So that's good news. But in order to really feel what it is, we have to ask ourselves, what is it like when I've hurt people without realizing it? Because probably we remember plenty of times we've hurt people and realized it. But has anyone said to you, you did this and this and that really hurt my feelings and you're surprised? Yeah, th those times? Those are really good examples of the way self-cherishing makes us blind to ourselves. You know, they might say, when you're abrupt or when you don't answer back or when you come into the room and don't greet me or when you leave without saying goodbye or something that to us is no big deal and we didn't mean anything by it, but we didn't notice that it hurt someone, right? It's that part of your personality or part of your psyche that just doesn't notice how much we might be hurting other people. But it's not like we're asking ourselves to become codependent and like hyper aware and like, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? It's not neurotic like that. It's just having the wide vision. So imagine self-cherishing is like narrow vision. Cherishing others is like a wide vision. So it's a little bit like the opposite of self-cherishing is when you are hosting something. Yeah, when you're hosting something and you want everyone to have a good experience, you have kind of an open awareness of everyone and the food and the temperature and all sorts of elements. And you're just kind of trying to keep everything in balance. Yeah. And when you're in kind of a happy hostess mode, you're usually fairly content yourself, but you're not like hyper-focused on making yourself content. You're actually focused on everyone else's contentment and you become quite happy as a byproduct. Yeah, not when you're in like neurotic hostess, oh my God, the, you know, the kitchen's on fire, not that one, right? But like happy hostess, right? <laughs> so, so just kind of sit with when you're in self-cherishing and when you're not in self-cherishing is obviously, what are the two versions of you? Yeah. Because there is that like version of you that is like a really gracious host, a really expansive patient friend, right? A really grounded decision maker. And then there's the side of you that gets tense and uptight and fixates on things that aren't important and gets easily offended and gets easily defensive, right? We both, we all have these sides, right? And so if you can kind of feel, all right, the agitated version is the one that takes everything so personally, that makes everything about you. And when you're in self-cherishing, it feels like you have to be because no one else will look after you, but you're actually miserable, <laughs> right? And then when you're in cherishing others, you're thinking of others and you're actually happy as an individual. You know, so you just like, what is your own version? Because we're all different, even though we're the same and having these two sides, just like, what is your own experience of being that side and the other in daily life? Do you know? Can you think of like a defining feature of when you've gotten stuck in a self-cherishing mindset? whether you feel comfortable to share or not, just kind of think what's a defining feature of your own self-cherishing. Either kind of like physically, how do you get? Or verbally, how do you get? Or, or what's the repetitive thought in your mind? Yeah, Margo, yeah. I really try hard not to do it because I grew up with a mother who was really, from what you're saying, completely self-cherishing in that, in that, there must have been a fear that no one would look after her. She was a single mother. 
And so she was excessively, you know, offensible. Like she was always ready to be offended, you know, and sometimes she would even set you up so that you actually offended her. You know, she'd set a little trap and you'd fall into it. And so I've tried not to do that because I've had, because she's been my teacher of, you know, of not doing that because, it, you know, I did it when I was in my teens <clears throat> and um, it's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mom. Here's what not to do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, is that, uh, you know, maybe many of us who come to the Dharma as adults um, were lucky enough to have someone in our life like that, right? Lucky enough um, to drive us towards the Dharma because we had someone very, very selfish in our life or someone very self-centered and harmful in our life. And we were wondering, am I bad? And are they bad? What makes people this way? And those kind of questions led us to the spiritual path and hooray, although we wish they weren't like that. But anyway, hooray. Right. Um, The question then becomes, now that you are a Dharma practitioner and a kind and loving person and working on mind training and being mindful, what is your stealth self-cherishing? Right. Your socially acceptable, no one but you knows self-cherishing because it's there. (laughs) Right. But we have to ask ourselves for me, what is it like? Because you know that you don't do the version that your mother did because you well and truly learned that lesson that that is not a nice way to be. But if you never see your own version of it, it'll be very hard to confront it. You know, so whether it's just kind of a, a mental tightness or a kind of a verbal shift, you know, some people become, very, very verbal when they're under the influence of strong self-cherishing. They kind of, you know, run over the top of people with their words, but then other people become very passive aggressive and silent, right? So you have to know your version of when you're being driven by self-cherishing. Are you a speedy railroading over the top of people or are you a withdrawing affection, passive aggressive, silent type, you know? Physically, do you kind of, get, uh, I don't know, a little bit like a house cat and kind of flop and sprawl and get lazy and I can't be bothered? Or do you get hyper busy and all in people's business and frantic with things? (laughs) Or both, depends on the day, right? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, in the um, chat, it says definitely the passive aggressive type, which is tricky because sometimes it's like socially acceptable, but you know the vibe right? The vibe, the energy, it's just withholding affection, right? It's not just being quiet. You're sucking all the air out of the room with you, right? So all of these verses, we have to make them so personal or they don't work. And as soon as we hear ourselves thinking, so-and-so should really hear this, You should add to that, "Uh uh-oh, that means I should really hear this, (laughs) right? I mean, that's true of all Dharma classes, but particularly mind training, the self-cherishing thought will get a little bit fragile and a little defensive and kind of say, no, but not me, I'm nice, (laughs) you know? And you are nice (laughs) and you have self-cherishing, you know? So it's, it's a gentle and delicate process, but remember, in the dharma when you're identifying negative behaviors and negative attitudes you're not identifying with them right taking responsibility not attributing fault that very delicate line where you're like okay there's a million reasons why i wound up this way a therapist could tell me some right (laughs) but not all um you know historians could tell me others but not all, right, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, there's a million reasons why I wound up this way. Let's just own it without ownership of it. (laughs) You know, it's like it happened. It's here. This is what I'm working with. (laughs) But I'm not particularly good or bad because of it. It's just here's what I'm working with. Here's what I have to purify. Here's what I need to shift. But it's not me. It just landed here. 
you know. So it's then you can do this kind of full on mind training, which can sound so aggressive and so full on, but it's not if you're not identified with your negative states of mind and your negative attitudes and habits. If you are identified with them, then it feels like it's an attack. You know, think about how you view skin cancer, right? Australians, <laughs> you know, skin cancer. If you see you've got a little skin cancer, you might think, oh yeah, I spend a lot of time in the nineties in the sun. And also I have Irish ancestors and also the ozone layer hole and also, and also, and also there's a million reasons why you got the skin cancer, but you're not bad. You're like, just burn it off, get it off or it'll spread, you know? And when you burn off the skin cancer, you're not thinking part of me is gone. You think, oh, good riddance. The cancer is gone. You're not like identified with your skin cancer, like, oh, my precious skin cancer, who am I without you? I need that freckle or I'm not me. You know, you're like, no, that's a danger freckle. <laughs> Get it off, right? So like this. All right, so just kind of let it sit, let it digest. Um, those of you that have had this teaching many times also just kind of think of what your stuck spots have been historically or things that other teachers have said that you found really useful that you'd like to share and just kind of sit with that. And we'll have, um, is it a 10 minute break or do you want a longer break? 10 minute break? Yep, okay. See you in 10 minutes.